start. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and get started. First of all, we both want to thank you all for coming out today. We really appreciate you being here. We're really excited. I'm Victoria Goss. I'm the Applications Chair and Technical Writer for the festival. Uh, I'm Taylor McCaslin. I'm the Information Technology Manager for the festival, and we are so excited to have you all here. Um, this festival has been quite a transition for the Cohen Works Festival. Um, we've pretty much gone from a festival that had no technology or very little to one that pretty much relies on it. <laughs> um, go ahead and take it from there. So what we're just kind of going to do today is we wanted to have a discussion about technology and the arts and starting with what we did with the festival and branching out into different types of organizations and different types of uses of technology. And we're going to have some lovely panelists come up and talk to y'all about various different things bridging technology and the arts together. And um, then we're going to open it up for a panel discussion. So if you have any questions about anything now or if they come up, feel free to ask. Um, that's really what it's all about, just having a discussion yeah. together. Yeah, I think uh, this session is, is very different from many of the other sessions um, in the festival, is that this is a very um, relaxed session. Feel free to ask questions to our panelists, to us. Feel free to stop us uh, at any point. And just, uh, we're here to just have a discussion really about technology and how it's changing the way we interact with uh, the world, really. Um, so let me quickly just uh, point out our guests today. So we have uh, Robert Matney um, at the uh, in theater. I'll introduce all of these again in a bit. Um, we have Erica De DeLeon, DeLeon. DeLeon uh, from Texas Performing Arts. And we have Cassidy Browning from um, UT. <laughs> um, sadly, uh, Ellie McKay from Zach Theater was not able to make it. Her cat is in the hospital. Um, so we wish her cat well, yeah. <laughs> um, but she has sent me a couple notes that we'll go over because um, they're doing some really interesting things with uh, databases at Zach Theater. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Um, we thought we would start the session with just kind of an overview of the technology that we've um, implemented and started using this festival um, and kind of talk about the why we're doing it um, rather than focusing on the how. Um, so, okay. Yeah, so we... Taylor and I started out in the festival, and I was applications chair, and Taylor's actually production manager. And we both kind of went through a career transition where we became really interested in technology. So we thought, hey, the festival, that's a great place to kind of play around. And the executive committee and the producers were really supportive and open to all of our ideas. And together, we created what, what you're seeing today, what you're experiencing now. Um, so one of the first things was we looked, we sat down and looked at the mission as an executive committee. And one thing that really struck both Taylor and I was the broadness of it. That art wasn't just theater and dance. Art was music and installations and even architecture. So we thought, hey, let's bring the festival back to the mission and really focus on extending and broadening the reach. Um, so that's where all of this really started from. The mission of the festival. Yeah. We just wanted to be true to that and and stick to it and really really push for a bigger a bigger sampling of different kinds of people and that's everything from applicants to patrons. And we've had some really interesting data. I know we have a lot of <laughs> a lot of that in process right now. Um, but overall I think we were really successful. The first thing we did was we took a look at the website, which Unfortunately, we don't have before and afters. I wish we did. disappeared into the ether. Um, but it was really, it was a hard to use website. Um, they put it together with the best intentions, but I think it was a lack of funds and or resources of knowledge that just time, everything. that kind of limited the, 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 the actual website. So along with Isaac Gomez, which he is our PR and marketing chair, and unfortunately he's not here today, um, the three of us sat down and said, let's build a website. I think part of the, the big thing for us was that in expanding the reach of the festival, we really wanted to make it accessible to uh, all different types of people. Um, and our original website just didn't support that. Uh, it was pretty much just a landing page for a little festival that didn't seem like anything. Um, so we really wanted to re-emphasize, uh, well, really just refresh our brand. Um, we've got these beautiful graphics that were done at Texas Performing Arts, um, and that we've kind of been given free reign to adapt and uh, change them as needed. Um, and we, 
we just kind of ran with it. Um, our website before had no accessibility as far as, um, so, uh, well, how do we say it? Um, Interactive. Interactive, yeah, there was just nothing. I mean, it was just a static web page that just had information about the festival. And even then, it was just hard to operate. Um, it had no accessibility features as far as uh, accessibility for screen readers, for um, a vision, um, or anything of that nature. Uh, and it also was uh, a static website that was not responsive to the screens. Um, one thing that I'll show you about our website right now, um, where's the edge of my screen? Uh, in between my screens. <laughs> uh, there it is. Uh, is that if you resize our website, um, you get a mobile version of the website. Um, and no matter what device you open this on, it fills the screen um, in a way that is useful to the device you're on. Um, when you open this on a mobile touch device, um, it's optimized for touch. When you open it on an iPad, it's optimized for an iPad. Whenever you open it on a computer, you get a full-size view to see everything. Um, let's, let's make this bigger. Um, and you can see that it just kind of reflows. Um, Another big thing while we're right here is that uh, we released an app this festival, um, which was something that we thought was a big dream wish. Uh, dream wishes is or what we are calling all of the things that like, how do you even explain dream wishes for us? <laughs> dream wish was kind of a theater term that was, it was coined by Will Davis. Yeah, I was going to say, like, that's, that's Will Davis. That's Will Davis. <laughs> She's the director of Colossal, which is great. You should go see it. Um, and it's something that you really want and is really important to you. I think that uh, um, oftentimes when Will's um, working as a director, he uses this term so that um, it's like shoot for the stars, right? This is your like the super super dream wish. This is your super goal. If if there were no limitations of anything, what would we try to strive for? Um, and then it's like, cool. What can we do to make that happen? Um, so that we think without limitations first, um, and then do what we can to get there. Um, we'll go back to the app in a bit, but I mean, so that was our big thought for the festival. Um, I'm happy to say that we worked with uh, COVA, the College of Fine Arts IT, um, and this website ranks um, in accessibility terms higher than the front page of the university, um, which is astounding in my mind. Um, we've optimized the website to be used with screen readers, um, with any type of accessibility device. Um, that was something new for me. I've never seen a website with an accessibility device. Uh, and I went to Kova IT and we hooked up a, I, it was a strange keyboard that was, I, apparently how you operate a computer when you don't have full mobility. Um, and we tried to operate the website and it was fascinating to see how hard that is to do. Uh, and we optimized the website for that. Um, so that's one way that we have directly changed the accessibility of even just the web presence. Um, partially with uh, this refresh of our brand, uh, we really pushed to social media. Um, we, I, the festival two years ago was, um, the Twitter, Facebook, I mean, they were there. there but Facebook and Tumblr, but all of the, exec the executive committee together, we have all become a real collective team mm -hmm. and a cohort that has pushed every single person's job to the limits that we could this year. And everyone has been extremely successful. Isaac and Roslyn, who are PR people, PR chairs, have done a fabulous job with Twitter and Facebook and Tumblr. We did a festival project of the day, so everyone got their, their spot in the limelight. And we've reached a ton of people, mm -hmm. which is awesome and really exciting for us. Yeah, and uh, the data that we're getting back from this, I mean, if you just look at these graphs, I mean, we've reached 20,000 people this week, uh, the Lincoln Festival, which is insane. Um, jumping back to our website, um, the, this week of the festival, we've had, well, we're on Wednesday, uh, halfway through the festival, and we've had 100,000 page views uh, on the website alone, which is mind-blowing for us. I mean, our website before, I think, since we released in September, we were getting like five views a week. <laughs> and then the festival shows up and we scale to 100,000, um, which to me was a technology miracle. Um, but it's just so exciting to see how far reaching the festival has become. Um, this is our Tumblr, which Rosalind, uh, the assist, uh, what is her? Uh, co. Co. Uh, marketing and PR. Um, she has done these fantastic 
um, media representations of everything in the festival. All the projects got shoutouts on our Tumblr through, I think it was like a month or two. Mm -hmm. um, so much awesome stuff. Um, we're also uh, live tweeting the festival, um, all sorts of things happening with this. Um, I don't know if you, when you came in, you saw that we are streaming a lot of these feeds to the giant TV screens downstairs. Um, just trying to get interaction with the festival. Um, let's see what else. We've got uh, our YouTube page, which I'm logged in, so you can't really see it. But um, our Google Plus page. It's just been amazing how far reaching all of this has become. Um, One of the other things that really started us off was the application, which is what I did for the first year of working on the festival. Um, and together we took an application that was a fillable PDF that you could print <coughs> and copies of and turn it into a table and put it online completely digitally. You could upload your documents, your videos, your audio, and just send it to us from the convenience of your home. And we had a lot of great feedback from the applications, chairs from the previous festival, and they were super helpful in giving us suggestions and kind of direction with what worked and what didn't work. Um, in the application, we were able to reach more people than we ever have before because it was online. And we got a really interesting cross-section of people. We got a lot of people from architecture, and we have a couple projects that are completely architecture-led, which is really exciting for us. We've made a real connection with that school. Um, and we also have more applicants than we ever had before. Mm -hmm. yeah, we had a total of 74 applications. Mm -hmm. 76 applications um, that reached, I think, over 300 students on campus um, across colleges, um, which was really inspiring for us trying to just broaden the reach of the festival. Um, we also implemented, the, so the whole thing was online. Um, people, our, our reviewers, we had 35 students um, from around the university who reviewed applications, primarily theater and dance. Um, and they could view all of the application materials, all of the submitted media online on their own time. Uh, and we came and had a powwow of like nine, fifteen, nine minutes. I, I can't even remember how long it was. Our selection meeting lasted fifteen hours. Fifteen hours. Yeah. Fifteen hours. And that's just you might be sitting there and go, Oh my goodness, but to us it was really important discussion. And I think yeah. we got a great cross section of projects. Yeah, and as you can see, I mean we, we ended up Filtering that down to about half out of the 76, we chose 40. Um, we've had a couple drop. We've had a couple um, that have changed been changed. Yeah. That's just the nature of the festival, and uh -huh. we're all prepared for that. Um, the scale of this has been fascinating as well. I mean, with 40 projects, we've moved to 180 events. Um, and just from a technology standpoint, to scale to something that quickly um, gets just really complicated really quickly. So. Speaking of that sort of thing, we should transition to introducing our special guest. Definitely. Um, and talk, this is kind of about us. Let's talk about other things. So you kind of heard how we've used technology in the festival. Now we're going to talk about technology on other platforms. Mm -hmm. So do you have to introduce Yeah, so we have our special guest today, Robert Matney. Um, Robert Matney is an actor and producer, a web developer, board trustee for Austin Shakespeare, mm -hmm. Festival Fusebox, a Fusebox Festival Technology Advisor, and Director of Technology for Breaking Strings Theater and Hidden Room Theater. Um, they've done some really exciting things with um, Skype plays, um, which maybe we can get Robert to talk about for us. Um, so if we can, go ahead and have you come up. Sure, absolutely. Um, we also have... We also have Erica Dillon uh, from Marketing Specialist from Texas Performing Arts. Uh, if you don't know, Texas Performing Arts is right next door. They produce all of uh, the shows here in the theater and dance. Uh, they are a professional company bringing in uh, Broadway shows. Um, and she is doing, she's touching a really a little bit of everything digital at the at Texas Performing Arts, from video to graphics to events, all sorts of things. Uh, we also have Cassie Browning, uh, Engaging Research Committee hey. Chair uh, for the festival. Um, Cassie is an activist, theater educator, practitioner, and scholar. Um, and she's going to talk to us about digital dramaturgy. Um, so this is our panel. Um, like I said, this is a very open discussion for us, so we're going to ask a couple of questions to get started. Uh, we'll have them introduce and talk about um, what they're doing that's exciting with technology. Uh, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and start with Robert. Okay, real fast. We also have Rusty Cloys here. Yeah. He's one of our producers. He's been a great supporter of us. So yay, Rusty! Let's take it away, Robert. Yeah. 
great. Uh, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Uh, I want to thank the Cohen Festival and, of course, uh, Taylor and Victoria for having me. Uh, I, I love that this is a moment in the two-year cycle where there's real permeability between uh, UT's theater community and Austin's professional and community theater community. Uh, and I think we all win when that happens. So I, I love seeing it, and I want to see more of as much of it as, as viable. Um, congrats also to you guys on the success of the, the site, uh, the apps, the lashing together of the various platforms. Uh, I also love the decentralization of uh, content management that you were discussing, um, I, I, the adaptive layout of the sites in terms of platforms, and of course the always important accessibility for various abilities, which is so easy to forget and so important to remember. Uh, I'm really impressed. I feel like th this is better than most festivals, certainly most, dang near all uh, festivals uh, out there, and it shows vision. And as you're going through it, I saw, you know, I saw familiar technologies go by, I see the sites built on WordPress, I see what, what it reflects is sophisticated use of simple tools, which is, shows vision. It's not that any of it's particularly um, difficult. What's difficult is having the vision that you guys have shown to, to put it together, right? It's connecting the pipes. Uh, and a lot of these pipes are really pre-built, and so I guess yeah. that's my long-winded way of saying it's available to everyone. You just have to think through it, and I think that's awesome. Um, so, uh, as, as they mentioned, I'm director of technology for a couple companies here uh, in town, and, and I love this work because it allows me to scratch two itches, the technology itch and the, the art itch at the same time, and forever I had to scratch them separately. That metaphor is going to break down real quick, so I'm going to drop it. Uh, okay, so I think we come to the theater generally to satisfy a, a Luddite urge to experience something more visceral, visceral, more live and less mediated, more unpredictable than a 2D screen can impart. With the result, the theater uh, itself has a tendency uh, to be late adopters of technology. And I, we have a, an obligation, I think, to remedy that. Uh, and in the course of that Remedy. We need to find ways to integrate deeply rather than yield bolt-on solutions where the technology is clearly just kind of a lump on the edge of the art, right? Um, so uh, my fellow respondents, sounds like I'm uh, going to speak about digital dramaturgy and I can't wait to hear more about that. I'm working with Mary Baldwin College's graduate theater program to co-create a, a digital dramaturgy platform at actorscholar.com, so I can't wait to hear more. Uh, about that. Um, uh, I'm also very interested in, in uh, IT systems uh, for business development, fundraising, PR community. They can speak to these things better than I can, uh, but they're very important to me. And I just want to reflect that I feel like it's all part of the same ecosystem when you start getting one of these pieces in line and they, they start feeding each other. So the fact that you've digitized part of your performance means that it's ready made for your PR team to kick it out. So it, it should all be pursued, I think, in tandem. Um, I'm here primarily with my hidden room theater hat on, and my central goal is to, to share, hopefully briefly, although as my lovely wife who just entered the room can attest, I can become boring quickly, so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move fast. Um, uh, talk, I want to talk briefly about how we at Hidden Room have integrated IT into performances themselves, uh, as well as my own personal pursuit of what I call digital interactive theater, which, is, which I define briefly as a new species of performance which transpires in whole or part across networked digital channels and employing interactive features that bridge performer and audience. That's a mouthful, but that's my definition for digital interactive theater. So in the pursuit of this, I've been able to be a part of some live streaming with a, a few different uh, organizations for uh, breaking strings production of Maxim Korochkin's vodka fucking in television. Uh, we doubled our audience size by using, uh, by live streaming uh, the show and integrated the Russian playwright's real-time responses and reactions into our post-show discussion. For Hidden Room's original practices production of Rose Rage, which is a concatenation of Shakespeare's Henry VI plays, we tripled the audience uh, and had backstage real-time conversation transpiring during the performance uh, between digital audience members and, and our uh, artists. Um, and for these, I've used both HowlRound's Livestream.com New Play TV uh, channel, uh, which I just want to point out is looking for more content. So if you're looking for a place to stream, uh, and this is New Works, and that's New Play TV, it seems like there's a real coherence here. So reach out to the folks at HowlRound if you want to live stream New Work. Um, 
and then also Google Plus Hangouts on Air. Uh, and Google Plus Hangouts on Air is, I think, kind of one of the best kept secrets of the social web. Uh, it has a lot of power built in. Um, with Hidden Room, we try to crack a distinct nut with each project. Uh, so one nut that we sought to crack was to patch together two disparate geographical locations into one contiguous aural and visual performance space. This was what we attempted when we worked on, uh, you wouldn't know her, she lives in London, which is what we called it in Austin, and you wouldn't know him, he lives in Texas, which is what we called it in, in London. Mm -hmm. uh, we tethered together a performance space at the Roundhouse uh, in London, and then a site-specific venue here in Austin. We would then remount it for Edinburgh, so it, it had a venue of the, under, the uh, Utterbelly, the Underbelly, the Underbelly in, in uh, Edinburgh, which has a big cow, which is why I said utter. Uh, that's its logo, that's a big guy. Um, so, so in that environment, we picked up using as high quality cameras as would match our bandwidth needs. We picked up the video in London and uh, cross displayed it on a with a projector in Austin. We picked up the same in Austin and cross displayed it with a plasma display in London. We set up a, a sophisticated miking environment in both locations so that if you opened a candy wrapper in Austin, you could totally annoy the audience members in London, which was our goal. We, that, that was what we were aiming for. We, what we did in lining them up metaphorically was to do it in a straight line so that you had Austin audience, Austin performer, display, uh, London performer, London audience. And so everyone had mutual visibility as well as mutual audibility. We took both video feeds and we um, turned that, encoded that as a web stream where they looked like they were looking at each other. So there was a third audience, this web audience. And then we encouraged everyone to interact with the performance while it was going on uh, behind a hashtag, behind a, a Twitter hashtag. Um, and we coached our actors on how to respond in real time to those tweets coming in. Uh, we structured the play such that there were jump off points from the written narrative to improvisational chunks and then there was an exit ramp and an entrance ramp. So the actors would cue each other, now we're back to the scripted text and they go back to scripted text. This gave um, a, a, a partial reality and, and a convincing illusion that it was entirely improvisational when in fact it was largely scripted but it felt like it was always responding uh, to the Twitter stuff. Um, and then also in all uh, three locations, we had the Twitter stream visual back to the audience. It was an exciting piece of work and it helped us learn a lot. It helped us learn a lot about the next nut that we wanted to crack, which was transcontinental rehearsals. So we wanted to be able to rehearse with Rose Rage, with actors that were in very different locations. We conducted a rehearsal which transpired in, in London, Cornwall, Virginia, and Austin simultaneously. Uh, and, and I call that one, that particular one with that many locations, the Brady Bunch rehearsal because of the number of screens, the squares. Uh, and, and we actually had one of those um, cheesy and also wonderful warm-up games where you pass the juju, you know, one of those theater warm-up games. And, and we successfully passed the juju transcontinentally. It was a, a fantastic moment. I, I, my, my, I had a little geek gasm. Um, so, uh, the, the, the next nut that we wanted to crack was uh, to feed new transmedia content to an audience during the course of a performance. So South by Southwest asked us to do a, a performance for this year's um, uh, interactive festival and, and we came up rather last minute with a realization of an idea we had talked about before um, which was to, the name of the piece was called The Girl with Time in Her Eyes. And in the course of the narrative, we would feed out uh, QR codes. And these QR codes led to a variety of different kinds of content out there on the web that kind of broadened the sense of the reality of what was going on. And the narrative was structured such that this was late breaking news. We had a device that was pitching out the QRC codes. And of course, we had pre-populated the QRC codes with content. Um, but but the, the theatrical illusion was that these were just coming in and it was new information. And, and what happened was the audience sort of conspired together to figure out what was going on. And that's what we really wanted. We actually had someone ask if the fictional events represented in the play were real. They were convinced by the breadth of our transmedia content that it was non-fictional. And that was actually quite uh, exciting and it reflected some success. We did more learning than we succeeded in that project because it, it was a rather last minute workshop. 
but it is something we're going to remount. And, and one of the things I'm looking forward to is one of the things you can kick off with the QR code is uh, a, a, um, a key to get onto a hidden uh, network. And so what I want to do is create an entirely alternate internet where we use routing tables to redirect. You couldn't do it if, if you were using um, you know, HTTPS, if you're using secure protocols. But if you're using non-secure protocols, you can, you, you can basically foist a false internet to a degree, or create an illusion of that. Uh, um, and so I want to create a kind of alternate internet which supports the, the narrative that's going on. Um, and I, I'm drawing to a close. I'm probably over on time. No, go ahead. Um, next note. Oh, plan, plan for the future. Um, I, Liz and I, uh, sitting at the back, are in the early stage of working on a piece which lashes together all of the House of Atreus plays and reimagines them. And in, in this piece, the audience will define narrative trajectories uh, in real time through periodic moments of structured feedback that will be collected digitally from the audience. So a little bit of a, 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 a updating of the choose your own adventure, but we're, we're trying to figure out the non-cheesy kind of graceful way for an audience to collectively make a decision that, that alters the course of the narrative. And, uh, I, I don't want to go into too many more details on that, partly because we don't know them, and partly because I want to keep some secrets as we work the magic out. But, uh, so those are the, the projects that, 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 have, that I've been working on and that are coming up for me. Oh, and shortly heading for a trip through Russia where we're going to be live, we're, gonna, we're going to go see a bunch of plays and meet a bunch of artists, which will be exciting and wonderful. But the folks who are, are um, taking us there want this to be as interactive and as live as possible with um, uh, theater makers in the U.S. And so we're going to be doing a bunch of live streams and live <laughs> tweets and things like that for that. And so that you can find out more info, info about if you're interested by Google searching Beyond the Capitals. That's the name of the program. And it's covered by the U.S. State Department and the Russian Federation as a kind of artistic, um, I don't know, artistic relationship building uh, diplomacy mission. And that's it. That's that's my long-winded <laughs> rant. Thanks for. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Um, so, like I said, the hidden theater. Um, there are lots of hidden things about that that is so exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so, really looking forward to asking questions uh, to Robert. Uh, let's pass it to Erica, uh, marketing specialist at Texas Performing Arts. Tell us about um, working at a large organization like Texas Performing Arts, and throw in some of your your journey. Sure. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of my background. I started in Parks and Recreation. I worked in that for 10 years. Uh, I was a marketing and special events coordinator for the Parks and Rec Department in McAllen down in the, the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, I did primarily special event coordination, but I also handled marketing, which was really limited uh, at that point to the traditional, the technological and social media stuff really hadn't come to play yet. So it was a lot of print and radio, that sort of stuff. Um, and I was really looking to kind of learn the new stuff. So I uh, moved to Austin. I enrolled at St. Edwards uh, for my MBA. They have a digital media management MBA program. And uh, when I was working there, I interned uh, with a company called dadlabs.com, which is actually a parenting company. They do primarily uh, web videos. Uh, and in working there, I learned a lot of the social media learning about how to put stuff on YouTube, online video marketing, um, social media, e-newsletters, all kinds of stuff. And, uh, that sort of led me to transition to another uh, local company, KirkusReviews.com, which is a book review company. And with them, I did a lot of similar stuff and also you know, helped it build websites or look, build web pages and, and that sort of thing. So that's how I sort of transitioned. Um, when I started my grad school program, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I thought maybe I wanted to work in TV news or something. Um, <laughs> and sort of the, you know, the internships found that I really like doing digital marketing, working in the digital space. Um, so I've been with Texas Performing Arts about five months now. Uh, I handle uh, website updates. Um, I manage their social media accounts. Uh, we're primarily on Facebook and Twitter, but we've got you know, Google Plus, Pinterest, all kinds of stuff. So I, the person that 
I took over for creating accounts everywhere. So <laughs> it's kind of I'm trying to, to go and see what we've got uh, everywhere and see uh, what what is useful because as I'm sure many people probably agree there's so many social networks and not all of them are are suited for a particular business. Uh, so you know that's some of the stuff that I do. I, I handle the eight newsletters if you ever get the week. That I create that. Uh, we I redid that, uh, reprogrammed it. We're, we had like a template that we were using, and I, I hand code it every week. It's much easier for me to do it that way. And I can kind of design it however I, I think it needs to be, depending on what we need to, what info we need to have that week. Um, coming up, uh, I know you you kind of mentioned the uh, responsive design for your website. I know that's in the future coming for us. Um, right now, this website is not designed. If you were to scroll in and right. out, it doesn't change. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we've done some workshops on that with IT. And I know, I guess whenever they upgrade to our, our new Drupal, we'll be doing that. So I'm, I'm interested in that. I, I've never really worked with that. So I'm kind of curious right. how that works. And, um, so that was, when you showed that, that was really neat. So I was like, oh, I have to do that. <laughs> so, um, Another thing I'm working on right now is uh, in the end of, the, of April, we've got our preview party where we'll announce all the shows for next season, uh, Performing Arts and Broadway. We've already released our Broadway schedule, but the Performing Arts stuff, um, there's only a couple shows I think that people probably know about. Um, and that involves creating a presentation. So I'll be doing a video presentation for that, um, kind of integrating that with PowerPoint. Um, and that's kind of new because I, I was mentioning earlier, um, I was familiar with Final Cut with the old version, and now I'm on the new version. And one of the interesting challenges with that has been that it's only now available through the App Store. Uh, you can't just purchase the software, which poses a problem on a university because you have to buy it through the App Store and it's tied with an Apple ID. And if I want to use my own Apple ID, then that's my software. It's a university property. So they had to come up with, apparently I'm the first person in the university that actually needs something from the App Store. <laughs> so the whole process of how to buy it, they had to go through me. So it took about a month for me to get Final Cut, which should be, you know, a five minute thing. Um, and it, you know, to them to come up with the process to talk to Apple and how to get a license, and then to download it and transfer it to my machine. And so that's been interesting trying to learn that, um, how that works. And so that's that's what I'm doing now, is kind of learning Final Cut, and you know, hopefully, I'd like to integrate more video, um, since I have a background in that a little bit. Um, I think it can be useful in, in sort of promoting things. So that's really what what's on the my plate right now, uh, in addition to the daily you know, website. I've got to build all the web pages for the new season, um, so that's that'll be my busy times right now. <laughs> <laughs> Question. I'm just curious if companies are providing you with video for that promotion. Are they doing that right now, or is it still a lot of print, or just still images that, that, that different performing companies are? Most of the stuff is still images. Um, there are some that have provided uh, promotional DVDs, and that's mm -hmm. one thing that I can take clips from. Um, I'll have to get nice creative. Video. I'm sorry? Joffrey had a nice video when they were here with Red Spray. Right. Mm -hmm. right, that one we had a good video for. Um, so that's kind of, I'm going to have to get a little bit creative with some of the stuff. Um, <laughs> that, for some things, I only have pictures. Um, you know, in some cases, my director really wants a video, and so I'm having to kind of try and rip clips from the internet. And, you know, <laughs> I'm certainly not going to put that out um, for everyone to see, but I think in the purpose of our, our presentation, um, it can be pretty useful. So that's one of the things I'll be doing. Awesome. Thanks so much, Erica. Um, I think it's interesting to see the different sizes of organizations that we have represented today. Uh, I think that would be something interesting to, to ask questions about. Um, but let's go to Cassidy now. Um, do you want to bring your picture? Um, I'll talk a little bit, and then I'll show some okay. examples, okay. if that's OK, because okay. um, my notes are on here, too, because I wasn't thinking ahead. Um, so <laughs> um, I, me and technology, a working process. Um, so, uh, I'm talking today about digiturgy, which we sometimes call digital dramaturgy, uh, because we're big nerds. 
Um, and so digiturgy is online dramaturgy, basically. Um, I've seen this used with Facebook accounts, Tumblrs, all sorts of things. Um, what I have done primarily have been wikis, so I've used Tiddly Spot. Um, Kiki, <laughs> Tiddly Spot. <laughs> it just sounds dorky, but that's right. Um, I prefer uh, wikis because of how they can be crafted as nonlinear um, resources. Um, I find that uh, Facebook pages and uh, Tumblrs and things tend to just sort of be a brain dump, which can be helpful in certain phases, and I actually do recommend it for a lot of projects, and I actually recommended it to a lot of the projects um, in the festival um, early in their processes for those early phases of like, I have this idea, I have this idea, this inspired me for this, and blah, 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 blah. But it only creates um, a chronological dump of things, and it's difficult to find stuff later and things like that. So um, so early phases, I think that those tools can be useful. Um, later on, um, I prefer something that I can um, structure a little bit differently. Um, so. Um, Basically, uh, my thought is, or um, the reason why I'm a huge advocate of Digiturgy um, is because it's cost-effective, environmentally responsible, it's engaging, and it's dynamic, and it um, accommodates and empowers its users. Um, so, uh, to me, specifically having worked in academia, budget is always a really big issue. Um, and as printing has clamped down more and more and more, um, since I've been an undergrad, you know, it's like, well, you can't, you can't print this, you can't print your syllabi, you can't print, you can't print your quizzes, you can't print your tests, so <laughs> it becomes a little insane. Um, so the idea of trying to print an actor packet of doom, um, as I often call them, um, <laughs> the notion of creating this huge thing that you're going to give to your actors and that that's going to have everything, um, is often not necessarily practical, um, because we're brought into projects sometimes a little bit late, and it's like, you need the packet a week ago for it to have been useful, so you're scrambling. Um, or you're brought in pretty early, and then you're like, great, I have all this stuff that then two weeks into rehearsal aren't isn't necessarily that useful um, because you've gone in a different direction, which is lovely, but you know that packet you gave them is now not very useful. Um, and so um, that's why um, its dynamism is so helpful. Um, so uh, yes, great. Um, obviously environmental, I'm not, I'm not printing a bunch of things out. Um, and also many campuses have official policies now with being green or paperless. Um, so yes, great, cool. Um, also, um, as um, these things are dynamic, it keeps uh, dramaturgical labor, um, to me, it keeps it essential and relevant, um, as opposed to something that happens at one point during the process of a sort of here's the packet and then end of interaction kind of thing, um, to something that can be a, a much uh, more of a conversation and something that's back and forth. Um, it can be useful throughout the process. So I've had processes where, um, you know, I've been there since day one of the director having the project, um, and so we use it for everything from uh, production notes, production meeting notes and everything, for a central place for those to live. Um, and now that's sort of come on. Um, what's the stage management website? Oh, virtual cardboard. Is virtual cardboard, yeah. 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 So, so yeah, so sometimes it starts to grow and become almost a stage management team thing. Um, but uh, so sometimes I've, I've used it for everything from those sort of production notes and everything to those very early design ideas. Um, those types that we're all, we're all dumping that together um, throughout to production. And then even beyond that, where these resources have been used, um, we've, we've sent these links and things to professors who are using these in the, their classes. Um, it's been released on, um, actually TPA did that for Jekyll and Hyde. We had a, um, uh, a wiki that was released. Um, so uh, so that these things can then, as you mentioned, um, spiral out and become something that's really useful um, for community engagement and teaching tools as well. Um, so overall advantages, like I mentioned, um, dynamic, um, easily changed, and I can incorporate everyone's work, pretty much. I can incorporate designer's work, I can incorporate um, director concepts, I can do images and video, links. Um, uh, to me also what's really important is that this, again, as you mentioned, decentralizes things. Um, that uh, it, it becomes something where uh, we kind of dissolve that dichotomy between the dramaturg as somebody who knows everything, um, as like, oh, I'm the bearer of knowledge, to like, hey, I'm a facilitator and I'm really happy and I, I'm nerdy about certain things and you're nerdy about other things and let's compile our nerdiness and, and have an amazing nerdy resource um, for our production. Um, so to me, that's an important move for decentralizing. It also empowers your, your, um, your cast if you're having them do research, which I always encourage as a dramaturg, um, also your designer work as well. Um, so not a sort of, you know, uh, dramaturg as person who does research for, but as someone who facilitates and does work with, um, with the group, and that that, that can be um, uh, rendered virtually, uh, uh, rendered virtual with <laughs> a website. Um, Okay, and then also a lot of times we're working with teams that are spread across the country or the world. Um, so this, again, gives us a resource that we can all access. Um, 
And it also, um, to me, in an important way too, as a teacher, that this allows for multiple modes of learning. Um, because of its nonlinearity, it reflects more of the way that we learn and think now. Um, specifically, our students who are coming up, those youngins, you youngins out there in the audience, um, are getting more and more used to things that are, are, are built differently, that are organized differently. This allows you to follow your own path through. So, like when you're on Wikipedia and you're looking something up, and you're like, oh, this has to do with this person, and there's a link, and I can go there. And then I follow that person over here, and now I want to know about this industrial revolution. And now that makes me think about Herbert. And you've gone on this, like, ah, and you've chased what interest you, interested you on this really awesome path. Um, and what wikis allow you to do is that sort of cross-referencing so that you're taking your own trajectory through as opposed to a packet or something more static um, that where I'm dictating sort of the way that you're going to navigate through that. Um, so it allows for different kinds of um, navigation for you to follow what's exciting to you. Um, allows that cross-referencing, allows multimedia, so again, we're appealing to multiple kinds of learners and things and reinforcing concepts with video as well as text as well as image. Um, it also allows you to include much more information than before. So a lot of times we're going, oh, how do I distill this down? Um, this can be a risk too because maybe you put too much in and it can become overwhelming. Um, but uh, it, it allows you to include more than you have before. Um, it also allows you to not have to reinvent the wheel sometimes because oftentimes I've found um, resources that are similar to what I'd like to provide online. Um, so I can link to that and say, hey, if you're interested in such and such, right over here as opposed to me trying to sort of refashion that into a, a more static um, format. Um, and then, I'm, I'm not necessarily tech savvy, but the wiki format's pretty easy to learn. HTTP, like basic, basic little coding, copy pasting, uh, not too terrifying. Um, and then I feel super smart pants when I do it. Um, so, uh, so I found it to me not too difficult. I've trained other folks to do it. Um, so I, I feel like there are a lot of really great possibilities. Um, as a central location, as a promotional site, um, can be used in classrooms. Um, it may also, in an important way, makes dramaturgical labor visible, accessible, and useful throughout the process. And that's something that we often struggle with because dramaturgy is sort of everywhere and nowhere um, in that way. So it's, it's a very sort of um, virtually and tangible uh, resource. Um, yeah, and so I mean, I, I do have concerns about it um, because it's sort of you're sort of stealing information. Your information can sort of be stolen too. Um, but I also find that that um, opening up of ownership exciting. Uh, but it can be sort of also terrifying in certain ways. Um, and um, that also also can start to situate your dramaturg as like a webmaster for the production, which is more labor and isn't something that they're necessarily trained to do. Um, so that's another concern I would have. Um, and as I mentioned before. Um, you know, the sort of possibility of overloading people with information because if it's just like this massive thing that, you know, you can't, that, um, I mean, hopefully it's organized really well, but if there's just so much on it, you know, there is the burden of, of too much. Um, so if, if the packet, the advantage of the packet is that it's distilling it down, um, perhaps the disadvantage of something like this is that you might just have too much. Um, uh, so, yeah, um, great. And so I'll just show you really quickly just what a couple of my um, wikis have looked like. I was looking up actorscholar.com as you spoke about it, so that's what's going to come up. It is very germinal. I look forward to your input in making it. <laughs> uh, this is what I did for Our Country's Good, which was um, a production in 2009 at Ohio State University. Um, so I created resources for each character. Um, uh, we also had quotes. I, I did things where we had quotes from each character, um, sort of um, important quotes from the text. Biographical information because uh, Our Country's Good is based on a novel that is historical uh, fiction. Um, so it was based in some, some actual folks. Um, you can see here um, my sort of cross referencing going on um, that there's an excerpt from The Playmaker, which is the novel on which it's based. Um, and I scanned PDFs of certain parts of the novel that specifically dealt with this character. Um, so then the actors could reference that. Um, the recruiting officer is, a, is an existing play that's done within this story. Um, so then she plays a certain role in the recruiting officer, so then it linked to my, uh, my page on the recruiting officer. Um, oops, just kidding. Um, I also have very extensive research resources for each of these. To me, this is probably the most important part of this, um, where you can start chasing down other information. Um, so it's basically kind of like a mini annotated bibliography where I just have a little bit of like, this is a collection of Clark's writings, boom, and it can be right here, and then you could link there. Um, historical context, so it's, it's basically the, the usual things we might see in a sort of dramaturg's 
Bibli um, Bible or um, uh, resource that they might give to the cast. Um, another important thing, um, the visual, er, visual, visual research, ooh, a lot of these are broken now, um, that designers brought in. And what else? Information about the playwright. And then um, other productions I've also found very useful. Um, and then just here's one on uh, Dracula, uh, which is actually by our own Stephen Dietz that was also done at Illinois State University when I was teaching there. Um, uh, so again, I had resources on characters. Um, for this production, we had uh, really heavy influences um, aesthetically. Um, so influences and inspirations was a really important um, section. So there's a particular performance artist, Anna Bernie Pantodea, and so for Turnus, uh, performance artists and musicians um, uh, using really strong aesthetics, as you can see here. Oops. Um, and as you've seen, as I've been clicking around, I installed breadcrumbs so that you can see where you were and go back. You know, there are little things that are super easy to, to um, click in. So I also have resources on the toe. You can go back, this is right there, German expression in them, etc. cetera. Um, um, information on Snowfer's novel, Victorian society. So um, just a couple of examples of what these might look like um, and the type breadth of uh, resources that you can put on here. Um, and this one in particular, I also linked all of these. Uh, if you click on the posters for the different versions, it links to a YouTube video of a clip from the different versions of Dracula. Um, so you know, I tried to do as, as wide a breadth as I could of all of the different versions and um, ways in which we've imagined Dracula over the centuries. Thank you. <laughs> technology systems, the scaling of things is, is quite important. I mean, that was so much information in such a, a small spot. Um, let's go ahead and see, do we have any questions thus far? Um, anything from the audience? Um, I know I have a couple of questions, if no one, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, those, those names sometimes used for things like breadcrumbs, like things like that, are those technical or do you just kind of come up with that? Technical terms, yeah, that was the name for, I wrote that, you know, that was the name for uh, what the, that programming that, that allows breadcrumbs. There's also like single page views so that when you start clicking on things, you don't just have like this gigantic thing that where it opens each page and you just have a huge thing you would scroll through. Mm -hmm. um, so I have like single page view installed um, to adjust it a little bit. So there's like these small things um, that you go there and there are resources to make this easier to use that, that explain what all of those things are. Um, so, so it's, I think it's a plugin or I can't remember. Yeah, like um, on our website we're using a plugin just cool, to generate plugins, these yeah. these breadcrumbs on the website yeah. so you can follow your track through the website. And it's a big accessibility thing, mm -hmm. uh, and it also provides great SEO, uh, search engine optimization on Google, um, really helping Google find the information that's on your page. Um, so yeah, it's it's really great. Um, definitely in the accessibility state as well. And if, if you go to like tiddlyspot.com, like it's got examples and it's like super easy. The impression I'm getting here, because we're not focusing on the how do we do this, the point is, is how is this useful to us, is that a lot of you, maybe your education is clearly in this, but are most of you self-taught or the, the you use kind of like the user guides and kind of work your way through this? Because I would say, because I know I've done WordPress before and that's what you use to get the, the website that is use, usable across all the different interfaces. Um, or is an interface works on all the different devices. That's all, you just like kind of, at this point, you drag and drop, right? And, but you said something to the effect that these are simple things you use. It's just a sophisticated use of simple, a simple programs and tools. I just, I guess I just wonder, how do you get the sophistication? Does that come with uh, trial, like trial and error, using this in a lot of different ways and seeing what works and what doesn't? Do you have any advice for people who are just beginning to use this technology? Like, how do you get the sophistication? Uh, let's just go down the line here. Let's start with Erica. Like, how do you use technology? How did you learn? Um, I, you know, I do have a digital media focus as well. My degree is in, but they didn't really teach us this stuff. It was more the business stuff, um, which was one of my complaints about the program. Well, I don't know how to do anything. <laughs> um, but I learned that just a, a lot of stuff I'm self-taught. Um, you know, graphic design, getting in Photoshop, and just playing with everything. Um, same thing with working with building websites uh, and building web pages. Is, you know, use the test pages. You know, if they have a test site, uh, 
because you can break that and nothing will happen. Yeah. <laughs> and fortunately, we do have a test site, uh, TP, that I can go into and, and try different things. Um, that would be my advice, just try things out. Uh, there's a really great resource online, lynda.com, if you're trying to learn specific stuff. That's actually what I'm going through right now to learn the new Final Cut. It's quite different from the one I learned on. Uh, what is it called again? Linda.com, L-Y-N-D-A. Um, and that one, when I was in school, that was one of the resources they referred to us. Um, and that, that's really useful. And there's a lot of things, I know when we were talking earlier, there's like Code Academy, um, which is a, a new resource online that you can kind of learn if you want to learn how to code. Um, and it takes you through lessons. Um, so I think there's a, there's a focus now with people knowing that that's a useful skill and knowing that not everybody has time to go to school and really, you know, learn that. But you can learn on your own, and it really just does take practice. Because, so, like I said, I, I didn't know any of it, and no one's ever really taught it to me. So mm -hmm. I just kind of had to, I was fortunate to be in situations where I had to, to get around and look and learn how to use things. Yeah, uh, you know, jargon is such a darn barrier everywhere in the world, right? And so I casually, you know, throw out adaptive layout, right? Which references a thing. It's an idea in web design, which is layout that adapts, right? And, uh, and different tools provide you that. And similarly, breadcrumbs is the name of that widget, but breadcrumbs is an idea that's been around for a little while. I just think, you know, I agree, uh, experiment and have your curiosity on full throttle and you know, don't use your Google foo, you know, like just, if you, you hear a jargony word and, it, and someone's being a jerk and using it, just go look saying? it up. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, and I was lucky enough to, you know, be with a person for a long time who was a big, big nerd, and I was like, hey, what's that thing you're doing? Hey, that's kind of cool. How do you do that? Um, so that helps, like, knowing somebody that you can bother, and, and, and if, if you can't just guilt them or you know, make them do something, then, you know, buy them dinner and say, like, hey, show me how to do this thing. I think it's really cool. Um, and also what I found too is that there things are being built to be more user friendly now, right? So like you're talking about like a drag and drop format where like tiddly spot is, is, is made to be as customizable as you can do it. So like somebody who's super great at this can do phenomenal, crazy, insane things, which is awesome. Uh, but I can also do something pretty decent with a lot of copying and pasting. So um, with short lessons from somebody, you know, you can get to do a lot of things. Again, yeah, trying it out, saving every five seconds. Because I didn't have test things, so I was just like, save, 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 save. Um, and Tiddly's great too, because you can download it to your computer. So even if you break it, you would just re upload what you have, and everything's okay. Um, so, you know, finding people to take you through it, because that's a way that I learned well. Um, also, finding um, finding um, resources that have good interfaces for you to use, that have easy, like you saw the different um, visual aesthetics to the different sites I had. Those are just things to copy paste this code, copy paste the code. Um, so, and, but you can also, you could tweak that indefinitely. So, um, so it, it can be super simple or it can be, you know, um, very uh, intricate. So yeah, testing it out and then finding folks to take you through stuff. Um, I'm going to echo everything y'all said. My person that I bother is this guy right here. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned so much in the past year and a half, two years. And it's really just sitting down, okay, what are we doing today? Today we're gonna enter, do data entry into Sketch. And okay, so what does that mean? And then sitting at a spreadsheet for four hours and entering, entering data, which was, I have a new appreciation for that. <laughs> so much respect for people that can do that really, really well. And it's like code academy, and it's just sitting down and being like, hey, you know how to do that, what is that thing? And just, I ask questions all the time when we're just yeah. sitting around doing stuff. And, I don't get it, I make sure to ask you or whoever I'm with yeah. until I do. Yeah, I think Victoria I mean, throughout this has, has learned HTML just because I've been like, hey, make this, update the website. Uh, by the way, you have to make format. Go, <laughs> Google. Uh, but, so you've learned HTML through a lot of this. I mean, I consider myself the coder of Newark's Festival. Um, I mean, I have a software background, so I'm familiar with actually coding things, but uh, a lot of our platforms, I mean, we use WordPress, we use a lot of open source type things. Uh, we use GitHub to manage the code of the website so that when I do screw something up late in the night when I'm hoping no one's on our website, I can revert it back and fix it or if things happen. Um, just all of that really, I, I think it definitely is a learning experience. I mean, work, I've come with this festival for me. I mean, 
the festival website was one of the first responsive web designs I've done. Um, and it was, it's gotten a lot better over time. I mean, like, V1 was, it's like, oh, look, it, it'll, like, reshape. And then, like, it just gets better and better as you, okay, well, that's how that works. That's, uh, well, I pulled this Google code from wherever, or I copy and pasted that. And yeah, that's this, what I was uh -huh. going to say. Yeah, find, find sources that you really like and then copy that shit. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I do a lot. I'm like, ooh, that's really cool. Give me the password so I can and copy your code. And... <laughs> yeah. All right, actually, aren't there, there's, Actually, there's some sort of something on the net where you can just copy the, you can copy the code from whatever website you like. You're not supposed to. Oh, yeah, so right. you're talking about developer tools, yeah. um, whereas <laughs> I can go inspect element and say, oh, look, there's what makes that website, um, that looks like a good div, let's copy and paste it. Oh, and you're nice. totally supposed to do that. Really? <laughs> like, so seriously, the web is built to do that, yeah. you know, because that's just, that's all your, that's what your browser reads. Your browser then uh -huh. just lays it out to you, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's what your it's what your yeah. browser's seeing anyway, so it's great for stealing from Darn. you. I Google a lot almost every day. How do I do this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, very much so. I yeah, most techies yeah. I know. Yeah. They're like I'm like, how do I don't understand how and they're like, how do you and I'm like, I could have done that. And they're like, yeah, you could have you guys do you guys know about let me Google that for you? Yes, yes, yes I've done it for <laughs> Digital <laughs> passive aggression. <laughs> <laughs> let me Google that for you dot com. Next time someone asks you an obvious question, go go check this website out and then send the link to your friends. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, let me do that for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, great question. Fantastic. Anyone else have any questions or anything? Yeah, I got one. Um, I guess this is for Robert. I, I was intrigued by the way you're using technology in, uh, in performance. Do you find that you bump up against the limitations of technology in that context? I was thinking specifically about if you if you got people, you know, actors on both sides of the world, don't you have some latency problems and those kind of things? You drive straight to the, what I think is the most interesting uh, discovery for me personally has, has been this, which, which is that the speed of light at, at a half globe circumference uh, takes for a round trip is, uh, 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 I'm trying to remember how many milliseconds, 115 milliseconds or something, right? And is it about 92 milliseconds that we start having, um, stepping on each other's lines in a phone conversation, right? And so speed of light isn't gonna get faster anytime soon, right? So the issues that are, are introduced from uh, the packet latency as a function of data transfer are never going away. They will never, it's not about having a faster router. It's here to stay. It'll get better incrementally, but it's not gonna go away, right? And so one of the most interesting parts of working on that particular show, the, this um, You Would Know Her show, was discovering that, that like when the camera was being introduced and film was happening, was being birthed, there was a set of acting techniques that had to be unpacked from the technology itself, which becomes our acting technique for, for film, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly, there is a set of acting techniques to be unpacked from acting for the compressed data stream, which is new in the world, right? And so, for example, there's a number of acting things you can do to accommodate that lag. Uh, from, from the simple uh, and really analog human of rather than give vocal cues, you know how when you're talking you might say, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. rather than do that, quietly nod your head because the lag of a visual data piece is less interruptive than the lag of an aural data piece, right? To the highly um, uh, technical, in a sense, which is a dynamic video, um, high, rapidly moving video, is less compressible than is static video for a variety of complex reasons. And so, if the lag is building up, and it does it, it's like plumbing, it's not like, it's more like plumbing, it's hydraulics, right? So, you know, the, the lag builds and it gets bigger and bigger, and if you need to buy back some space, go more still. And your actor can read that while they're acting. So one technique for the actor is learn how to read the data packet latency that's happening as a result of this lag, right? And go more still to buy yourself more space. Uh, so that when you have that really dramatic moment in about two minutes, you've got enough, you've got <laughs> enough packet latency you know, room to play with, right? So, so there are limits. What's exciting to me is that we get to bump up against these limitations and figure out how to address them for the first time, these particular ways of bumping. Yeah, great question. Uh, 
Um, any other questions? I have another one, but I feel like I don't want to ask another oh, come one. On. Okay. Um, and this is kind of an unfair question. I'd like all of you to answer it. Is how do you feel personally about like the arts and technology integrating? Is it imperative that we that we do this, that we be that we have this involved in the process? Is it a get on or get out of the way sort of thing? Because I worry about that a lot, and also about getting a younger audience to come see shows. And it seems like this is the only way. Right. So how do you feel about that? That's such a huge question. Just try to, in your own way, be like, this is why I do this with my free time, is because I don't see any other way, or like, tell me about that. Can I get away with not doing this? You want to jump in? Um, sure. You know this, um, I have this phenomenon in my social sphere, which is, uh, I have a lot of smart, um, wonderful, thoughtful friends who have children, and yet, when I look at my social circle, the folks who are thoughtful about things like overpopulation and negative impact of having kids, et cetera, et cetera, uh, are the ones that they choose not to have kids very often. And there's a way in which this creates a reverse Darwin effect, right? The, when the folks who are going to propagate, hopefully, a sense of thoughtfulness about <coughs> what it means to have children don't have children then the world gets populated by people who have a lower chance of having that sensibility propagated. Uh, do, do, do you, okay, so, yeah, similarly, <laughs> oh God. Oh yeah. <laughs> Apologies. I, no, I no. Uh, similarly, uh, we come to the theater, I think, for that Luddite urge. We come to be human and not digitized. And it is those considerations that must be propagated into the digital world. And so for me, it feels imperative. We, as people who are sensitive to the need to not have everything mediated, need to enter uh, into the digital world with our art and with those considerations intact to advocate for a humane way of having technology be a part of our life and art. So I think it's imperative. Wow, that was a really, really good response. Thank you. That's exactly your argument would be that theater doesn't need technology, but technology needs theater. Uh, life needs theater, and yeah. life will become more technological, so the theater better be able to meet life where it goes. I was saying, yeah, I think, I think actually not what you just said, because I think that theater does need technology in some ways. In certain, I mean, in very basic ways, like we've already mentioned, in terms of accessibility, because, I mean, there's, there, there are a ton of, you know, um, I run into this with teaching a lot, um, where they have technology in one of our large lecture halls now called Lecture 360, Echo Capture, Woozy Wetsy. Uh, with balloons, I don't know, it's like some really long name. Um, but it captures what, what's on the jumbotrons that I teach upon, because they're jumbotrons, um, as well as what I say over the mic. Um, and it records this and it makes that accessible to students. Now, part of this to me becomes a concern about like, the who owns that? Is that mine? Is that the university's? Do they need me anymore? Do we just start playing that? Or do students just access that and we no longer interact with people ever, right? Because I can't take attendance in those classes. Um, they're just too huge. I don't use the clickers. That would be one way to do it. But, um, you know, so like potentially somebody could just stay at home and watch those videos when and if they please and come for quizzes and exams. Um, and that's terrifying. But also I was like, well, that's kind of a kick in my butt to make sure that coming to class is worth it. Um, so, so it's great in some ways in terms of accessibility because um, particularly for students who have different accommodations and things like that, they can go back and watch stuff. They don't have to be freaked out about taking the notes in, in the moment. Um, you know, they can take notes later, or if they can only take some notes then, they go back and they rewatch. Um, so, so I think it makes it more, you know, it makes it more accessible in some ways, but it also starts to question the value of the live. So, so as somebody dealing in a, an art that depends on its value as being live, um, I try to, like I said, it sort of kicks my butt a little bit more, I think, in some ways, to make sure that what we do live is worth it. Um, so, so I think it's a matter of using what it can give us, because I feel like the accessibility for um, our schedule, ticketing, all sorts of stuff has made this festival so much, um, so much greater than it, than it could have been. Um, are so much more, you know, the organizational capabilities, people to make their schedules, to be able to make more things, uh, make more events um, and, and attend them. Um, I think that has enhanced it. So I feel like theater, performance, art need it in many ways because it, it helps it out a lot. Also, as we're depending on these things, they're part of our lives. It doesn't make sense um, to try to resist that because it's happening and it's and it's it's going to happen. It is happening. It's everywhere. So I feel like harnessing it for what it can give us. Um, 
but then also making sure that we don't lose uh, what it is about theater that, that is theater, about the live interaction. So um, this is also something I've run into. I've worked with um, Yakov Shavir in our department, who does um, dance work with visual dancers. Um, so sometimes people are dancing with, um, with completely virtually generated dance partners. Um, but there's some really awesome stuff that just blows my mind about um, sensors on the, on the live dancer's body that feeds into a computer and then the computer spits up the dancer that's responding to it via an algorithm. And I'm like, what? <laughs> because my brain hurts. But it is about the live body, but it isn't. But there's this virtual dancer that becomes imbued with realness and liveness. Um, there's also dance pieces he's done where people have texted and tweeted things that are that's text literally shown on bodies, and then the dancers do that. So they might yeah. they might like one of the pictures is flock. And so then the dancers around the person that's being projected upon start doing a flock motion. Mm -hmm. So there's something amazingly more alive and interactive about me texting something that then happens right there that's really cool, that sort of enhances the live, um, but then also questions it. So I, I feel like that tension is what's important and I have found in, in teaching and in theater and, and, and life and art um, that 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 has um, that tension is important to remember and to try to harness what we can what we can uh, to enhance things and then also use that to say but let's not lose it and let's make sure that um, that it doesn't become a replacement for that we keep these things in conversation um, and, and use that to motivate ourselves to to remember what what it is about the line and the ephemeral um, uh, that um, the theater is that that liveness is and that live interaction is. Um, that wasn't nearly as succinct and but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I the idea of always keeping the tension. Mm -hmm. You're always pulling back as opposed to just allowing it to go in one direction entirely. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for making that smarter. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's the sound like things that we've discussed. Is there's performing arts centers that are allowing live tweeting mm -hmm. at their yeah, events. Mm -hmm. uh, because you have, you know, Broadway's always going to get people and when Eddie Vedder comes, that's going to sell out. But right. who's going to come see, you know, a classical chamber ensemble or something mm -hmm. like that? It's going to be a lower crowd just because that's kids aren't really growing up listening to that by and large. Um, and so that's kind of one of the things we talked about: is do we need to integrate more because young people use social media and they want to tell you what they're doing right now? Um, do we, you know, do we allow that? Do we let people kind of live tweet? the Joffrey Ballet or, or whatever, um, whatever event they're watching. So I think that's one of the things that's kind of may start to be shift, and there's still, of course, that train of thought that, no, you're just supposed to go and, and experience it. Um, and so that's you know, one thing that, that I think might see changes. It's just more interaction like that. Um, and even things like I know, the, the Met in New York, they live stream you go to a movie theater and watch the opera. Right. Um, and there's a lot of traditionalists that don't like that because they're not going to the theater. But you know they're doing that at the Elma Draft House. Yeah. I mean, you you yeah. see stuff and so it's like funny to me too, not just not in a yeah. in a theater but you're in theater. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're watching the thing. So there's a, I think high art, low art and class is also working yeah. in that too in interesting ways. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting it's you know there's I guess it's a shift now now that we're so socially interactive uh, and that would be interesting to see what happens if people just allow that to happen or just kind of stick to their guts you know, it's, it's got to be the traditional so. great that was fantastic i think I, for us it's been really interesting <coughs> to see um, the interaction that we've been able to get through digital uh, platforms i mean this is, I, for us, it's, we've been in front of computers for the past two weeks, like, and so I mean, at that, like, yeah, we get it, like, if we go hide and, you know, get detached from the world working in digital systems, but at the same time, some of the, the reach that it provides is amazing. Um, I mean, we've got a, a performance group here from Exeter, England, and I, what's fascinating to me is that I can go on Google Analytics and see that people from Exeter, England are on our website and interacting with it. And for me, like that's such an amazing accessibility thing for those people to experience those things. Uh, we live streamed the opening event. Uh, I think we ended up with like 100 people watching that um, live online on New Play TV, um, which is fascinating. Um, 
I, it's just so accessible now um, that we can, you know, go on Google Plus, have a hangout with someone who's in Australia or in London, or it's just so limitless in my mind. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, it's a fine line you walk there, um, losing that human interaction, but also kind of gaining a new super human interaction in kind of a way. <laughs> yeah, for us, we always really brought it back to help. We want to we want to bring this to other people. We want to give this to everyone. And what's the best way to do that? I know we did. We also discussed tweet seats, but yeah, that, that kind of we, we yeah. sat on that for a while and we're like, hmm, no, maybe maybe not because this is. It seemed to not quite fit this cycle, so we're like, okay, so no, that's not the right, the right thing. So there were, there were, of course, a lot of ideas brought up, and people were like, yeah, I'm totally for that. No, I'm totally not. And it was like having everyone's perspective. Yeah, well, I think so. part of that too is that that would have been making a decision for all of the 40 projects, yeah. mm -hmm. and we're spanning so yeah. much. But we actually do have one piece um, that's part of our filament series, Believe You Me. Um, that encourages live tweeting, uh -huh. live, yeah. uh, live uh, Facebook game. Oh, oh, other ones are as well. Deja vu as well. Excellent. Um, so you know, you go and you sit down for Believe You Me, and there's a piece of paper that gives you the handles, the this, the that, their website to go to. You're being encouraged to take pictures. There's he passes his phone around and asks you to take pictures during. Mm -hmm. um, so we're all you know doing these things uh, constantly throughout, and, and but his is about the sort of consumption of mass media. Um, so he's trying to sort of heighten that in that moment as well. Um, but yeah, so we, so I think part of that discussion too was like we would have been making a decision for 40 projects, um, but some of them have decided to utilize that um, within their pieces. Um, yeah. I, yeah, here's just an example. I mean, this is a live stream from our mobile app with people who are interacting with you. I mean, here's the photo of what we're doing right now. Um, I, it's just so interesting to see. Like this to me is really fascinating. Um, and it's just amazing to see the kind of community that this kind of creates. Um, I'm almost a little scared at what might pop up here, I mean. <laughs> but that's a real reason. <laughs> that's live theater. Yeah, yeah, live theater, there you go. <laughs> this is a fairly practical question that, that uh, we as producers talk about and as an executive uh, committee large actually we talk about. But, um, we didn't completely commit to an entirely digital festival as far as our marketing or our materials and all of that. Uh, it is something that we questioned. We were we, we decided we weren't ready for that because of all the different people that we hope to reach. And, and certainly this has allowed us to reach so many more people than just print uh, marketing would. The question will come up for next festival is whether or not we actually spend the money on any of those materials, is it worth it anymore to do that? There certainly are, are this university is a fairly wealthy uh, community. So a large percentage of the people coming to our festival have devices of some sort, right? So they have they do have accessibility to the uh, digital media or all of this stuff. But we wanted to make sure that, that all of anybody that wanted to could still reach the same material. Um, do you guys have any comments on that? Do you have uh, feelings? To, we felt strongly that we couldn't completely uh, go away from that. And I don't know where we'll be next in two years. You know, the digital divide is so important to be attentive to in the same way that we need to be attentive, I think, to accessibility for different abilities and things like that. Um, uh, so, I don't know, I commend you for, for being attentive to that, that need. I feel like in performances that have integrated technology, it seems to me that it, it is ethically valuable to try to provide people the tools to engage with, with you know, your way. So, for instance, at South By, we didn't because we knew that audience. They all were ready to, you know, they had their holster. <laughs> their, no. But, but it, in other contexts, we would want to say, use yours or check out ours somehow, right? And that adds new resource constraints. How do you do that, right? Um, so I think that that seems very important. Um, as far as print stuff, you know, I feel like, it clearly, print marketing clearly has diminishing value, um, and, and it's just about targeting it. If you've got a set of people, if you can s slice out your demographics such that you know who's more likely to use and or require paper as opposed to digital, that's the key, and that's just about going into your you know, people database and 
making smart choices about you know who should get the postcard and who should get the email and you know an email with a link to the PDF to print your own poster if you want to print your own poster you know whatever. for sure all of the programs the guides things like that that are on the table I don't know what the percentages of people that still have picked that up in addition yeah, to having Yeah, it does seem like that. they didn't go away as quickly as they did last festival. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an interesting thought, yeah. But but they are still going away. They are. Lot, yeah, there's yeah, still a lot so. left. Right. So, I mean, I use the app while I'm walking around all the time. And exactly. I refer back to right. the guide if I have a moment and a minimum office that I have it with me. But if I'm just walking around, the app Well, if I, right, yeah, I, I use the guide most often when I'm helping other people. Mm -hmm. Come in and they go, that, and I'm like, hey, um, I'm not using it, but I, I feel too that there's a point at which there's also diminishing returns of the virtual in some ways because those e like I the I used to roll my eyes at people who were like, oh my gosh, I get so much email, blah blah, I can't through it, blah blah blah, and I was like, mm -mm, no, you stay on that, blah blah blah, right? And now I'm like, ah, I might email the dying fire because I just get so <laughs> much, and it's so useful and it's so amazing. But I'm also just like, oh my gosh, I'm so oppressed by email and my first real problems. So, um, so I feel like there's almost a diminishing return sometimes in emails, uh, specifically email, uh, because there, it's just becomes white noise at some point. So there is something actually that's become interesting and shiny about getting something in print. It's like, oh, I have a thing. Um, and now having things are more helpful. Like I used to have a digital to-do list, but I've had to actually switch to like a paper one that's like a like a post-it note around my hand because I just stopped paying attention to it because all the virtual stuff has become white noise in a way. So there's there's this weird like pendulum swing for myself, and I know a couple other people that I know where where the ephemera, the the physical thing, is actually um, shinier and actually used and can become uh, something to which I will pay more attention. Um, so I, I think there's there's something interesting there, and I don't know what, but. <laughs> Re related, relatedly, in two years, uh, three three yeah. D printers are, are going to be <laughs> they're going to be everywhere. Do you know? I mean, I don't I don't think we'll get be in a place where the majority of us have them. Four years we will, you know, and so hopping out in front with printable p ephemera. Right. Uh, Light that would show one <laughs> heck of a forward-thinking, wow. you know, approach. And 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 I think I, Autodesk suggested recently that they're looking for educational partnerships to so, so there there might be a, a business connection with Autodesk. And I'm sure UT has a bunch of licenses with Autodesk to get their attention easily. And so that would be one heck of a forward-looking next festival. Yeah, I definitely echo all of them. I know that starting out in the, our process of working on our to-do list, we used um, an organizational site called Trello, which was really helpful and really great. It got to the point, though, at least for me personally, where we had like five to-do lists on Trello, and I just yeah. couldn't keep them straight, so we're like, let's get this whiteboard out, and we're going to write things down. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it's like the pendulum swing is such a good metaphor for that because sometimes I'm like, oh, well, got it, I am on it, and sometimes I just need a sheet of yeah. paper so I can scribble things. Yeah, this is our elusive New York system to do on Trello, 65 out of 67. <laughs> To do's that's just progress. like we wake up some mornings like oh yep Victoria was up at two a.m. she chucked off like four things I'm doing nothing and I get up to Victoria. Maybe brushing my teeth foolish. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's very very interesting. I think it's a very fine line. Do you have questions, comments? It's truly amazing, you know, what's happening with you know, to me of, um, of the archive that we talk a lot about in, in performance studies and, um, and and oftentimes we're talking about ephemera um, 
So, you know, um, the, the tangible things, right? And the everyday things. So it's not just the program guide that's in pristine condition, but the one that you dragged around all week. It mm -hmm. has your notes and things like that, right? Like, and what's cool about that is that somebody touched it, it's somebody's notes, it has their coffee stain, it has the this, the that, um, and that there's value to all of those things. Um, but these, these things that don't necessarily have those qualities, you know, like HTML copy doesn't necessarily have those qualities. Um, although, we put Easter eggs in those things, and we mess up, and stuff. so I mean, there are, there are, um, it's not just um, infallible, but, you know, what happens with this notion of the archive just expanding exponentially, and just always existing in the same way that it existed before, because these things won't break down um, in the way that a costume would. Um, so that starts to hurt my brain too in, in cool ways where I'm just like, what does this all mean? Like that we, that we, and, and, and what happens when we save over? Because there are so many versions where, you know, we go to the um, HRC and we can see the different versions of Tennessee Williams scripts, right? Mm -hmm. And his notes and blah, 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 blah. And we see the next typed version. Uh, but if we're just saving over, there, there's a notion of that too where they're starting to get archive collections and it's like, do we keep each version that was saved? And then also, what, what are we not seeing if somebody just saved over that each time with their revisions? We're just seeing the end product and we're not seeing all those phases that we would have seen between. So the notion of the archive also is sort of exploding and, and um, fascinating and exciting things too. Certainly the data. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's just yeah, I, I think something really interesting, I, even in this like physical digital thing, is I mean we're scanning tickets to to get people into venues and to monitor that. I mean, there are, or how many twelve thousand eight hundred tickets to performances at Newark's through the entire week, and we now have exact counts of how many people, how many VIPs showed up, how many walk-ups were let in, how many standbys were let in. I like the data is just immense. Um, we're tracking everything about who's on our website. Those 100,000 views, I have information about your web browser, your location, your um, what you did, what pages you viewed, the order you viewed them. Like, it's almost scary what you can know. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's like, it's <laughs> um, Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. There's so much data. And I think this is also something of a business, um, an interesting business model of what do you do with all this data you capture. Uh, I mean, for our festival, yeah, it's great. We have some counts now that. It's not just a, um, 8,000 people showed up. You know, now it's like, no, 10,000 people showed up, and, you know, it's really interesting. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And 40, you know, 400, blah, 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 were students, and this many were these folks, or whatever, because you, we also had, when people, um, uh, got tickets, it was like, are you a student, or are you a faculty, are you this, are you that? So, you know, we're, there's also, yeah, for these reserved tickets, we also had that sort of data, um, which then will hit hopefully I would think, um, hook into how then we advertise for 2015 and how all that happens. Yeah, but with all that data now, all of a sudden, like you have real, real numbers and real facts that you can help not only with your marketing but your funding. Right. And so. most organizations, I mean, when we start talking about like where where the arts going, the first thing that comes up is always funding. Right. And people, people like businesses, are saying like, oh, well, I'm not going to give you any sort of for profit funding unless you can show me numbers. And now we can. That was a fascinating thing about the digital application was that the last festival we had, we don't even know what was application to our um, we so like, we, I do. Well, then we do. Okay, well, I haven't seen them. And I asked them. <laughs> but like, with this application, we know exactly 300 students across five colleges on right. campus, and we can tell exactly how many. Um, I mean, we've got an architecture student in the room right now who's part of the festival. I mean, like, pure data numbers that, like, look, so we're reaching so people. This is what we're doing. Give us money. Well, and that, and that when you have the forethought to do that is so easily mined. Whereas later, like, yeah, we have the paper copies. We could go downstairs right. and, like, write the things. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure it out, but it would be really good. Now it's an Excel spreadsheet. Right, right. right. And, and specifically as, um, as a free festival, you know, right. how would you ever get that data? Um, and now we have that, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question for Rusty, actually. Being part of this, and I mean, I feel like the students are really pushing the boundaries, which is super exciting. Most definitely, to me. yes. <laughs> What did, what have you learned, and how do you see what you've learned here, perhaps filtering into other operations in the department? Uh, I certainly see that it, the labor that goes into this is significant, and I, I, what I have found is it's worth it. Um, I think from here on out, we need an IT manager for the festival. That may become something that we have to if there isn't a student that happens to have those, that's not what we teach you. 
we, we do some digital art and, and work in it, but it's not how to handle all of the information technology. Um, but there's no way we can do this festival again without that, right? Not this way. We've now established that this is what it is, so we have to move forward with that. All of the, the ease of all the ticketing uh, has changed tremendously since the last year in all past the festivals, uh, which is, re I really tip my hat to you guys, because that's been a huge difference that I've noticed in the flow of the festival. Um, and I think that that could benefit uh, our department, right? Uh, certainly TPA already does uh, all their digital readers and so they have that going on. But for our, uh, our department, which I don't know if they come over and do that, um, but the department would benefit, would reach so many more people. The amount of people that we, that, that have come and seen what the festival is via the website or the applications or all social media uh, is huge and, and, and important. So, Yes, our festival is nationally recognized. Yes, there are a lot of people that know about us. There's so many more people from many different areas that know about it now. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's way beyond my understanding. Uh, I could sit down and I could learn it, I could figure it out, but there's, uh, there isn't enough time for all that. And so it's just, it's not necessary. And I don't think that there's anybody that wants to go back. I hear you also saying that it's extended our audiences. I Perhaps absolutely believe that. Yes. I think that our guest artists are here, right? They mm -hmm. their personal friends usually. There's some personal yeah. contact along the way. Pretty soon they're not going to have to be personal relations or personal contact with anybody to want to come to this festival because of what they can see and experience. And they're going to go, right, I want to come. I want to be a part of that. And I think that that has been allowed because of our uh, digital presence. Yes. I mean, besides the fact of the quality of work, I think mean, the festival is dynamic, but so many more people know it, or can know it now and experience it. Yeah. And just something along the lines of ticketing, just because um, I was also on the executive committee for 2011, um, and we hadn't really, I think that was the first year we did advanced tickets. Um, the year before, yes. the, or the festival that before great. that, I think we did some like VIP-ish reservations, but everyone else, it was always waiting in lines. Yep. Um, and so there's something that's really awesome about, about I was able to like sit down and be like, cool, I'm going to be on this panel, I'm running that then, I'm running that then, what can I cram into everything else? Um, so there was something really cool about me being able to plan ahead and get those tickets and things like that. But I will say that there were concerns brought up last cycle about like what does it mean to change the culture of the festival from something where it was you just hung out in the building all day and you went and grabbed a sandwich and then waited in line for an hour and chatted yeah. and like those conversations that happened while you were waiting in line and chilling in the building, um, you know, as, you know, for an hour and a half before a show because that was like the show you wanted to see so you knew you got there early, you know, like that that does change the culture of the festival mm -hmm. um, and it and you know, and it is something different for us all to be going. Where am I? Okay, yeah, okay. Well, I have a reserved ticket, so I think they're five minutes before, so I'm gonna you know get my coffee and your whatever, um, run to my office. So so you know I, I don't want to just say like ah it's made everything amazing because I mean I think it's increased efficiency, but I think we have to think about the cost of those things too, um, where where it's great in so many ways, but then also there is this like what does that mean for something that um, was very much about. Being very open, very very free, very whatever. Like you get in, you don't get in. Yeah, you know that's how it happens. Um, so it it does change the culture of the festival in many ways. Um, mm -hmm. So just to pop it as well. Awesome. Well, we are out of time. This has been such a great discussion with everyone. Uh, I want to thank so much our guest respondents today. <laughs> this has been really exciting, and I hope you can walk away with just. Um, even if it's a little something that like I can maybe use that or I want to try this or maybe I want to go do a course on Code Academy like that's what we're trying to facilitate is trying to get people to use technology and think about what you get what you pay for I, the positives the negatives all of that so um, thank you so much for attending um, enjoy the festival thank you. <laughs>